Thank you and good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Attorney General. I see some unfamiliar faces, so I'll introduce myself. My name is Attorney General Drew Wrigley. Uh, others will be introduced as we go throughout here today, but I do want to note uh, Chief Deputy uh, Attorney General for North Dakota, Claire Ness. Uh, also up here with us, uh, Chief Agent Casey Miller from the BCI, and we've got a number of BCI agents here uh, on the back wall, and I want to thank them uh, publicly. Uh, for the work across the last week uh, in conjunction with so many others in law enforcement. Uh, and there's going to be a lot of that sort of talk in the days ahead, every bit of it uh, very justified. We should begin this morning uh, where we should always begin uh, in prayerful thanks. Even at a time like this, prayerful thanks for with humble grace and thanks for the peacekeepers, many of whom are here today, uh, all of whom should know that they are remembered here today. We are uh, this morning reconvening, uh, I guess, uh, the communication this week uh, in the wake of last week's horrible Friday afternoon events. Uh, we were in here this week on Wednesday to talk about the heroic efforts, the life-saving efforts of police officer Zach Robinson in the face of a savage attack we concluded and announced that his actions were reasonable. His actions were justified. His actions were in all ways lawful. To which we would add courageous. To which we would add selfless. We want to caution you as we get started here today that this remains an active investigation. What we're doing today is a little out of the ordinary in that we're talking about this matter uh, before the conclusion of that investigation. But for a variety of reasons, it's important that we do so. And I wanna thank all the law enforcement leaders who are up here uh, today, not all of whom will talk today, but uh, we're all available for your questions. Please keep in mind also that this is the best information that we have as of today. I know things today that a couple of days ago looked a little murkier. We're going to answer the questions that we can answer. We're going to answer questions that we can responsibly answer. So that'll begin. There's going to be some photos up on the screen from time to time. I can tell you there will be nothing that will be um, uh, uh, ghoulish or along those lines. But we want to uh, convey the best information that we can. Uh, these times uh, remain, just take them for their uh, close, the best approximations that we have, sometimes because things are time stamped, uh, what have you, but it's the best information that we have. It's almost hard to believe that my first line looking down here, that such events can transpire in the wake of a fender bender, a fender bender in Fargo, North Dakota, 2.42 PM. There's a two vehicle fender bender on 25th street South. The vehicles were proceeding South. They were just north of 9th Avenue. Carly Coswick, who had just recently moved here to Fargo, was in one of those vehicles. She was alone in the vehicle. She was driving. The other vehicle had uh, multiple occupants. Fargo Fire was the first on the scene in response to the call that went out. They arrived on the scene at 2.48 p.m. A minute later, Fargo police response resp uh, arrived at 2.49 p.m. That was officers Andrew Dotis and Tyler Hawes. Minutes later, and when I'm referencing these matters, we have a, an array of videotape uh, from the public, from private sources, and from law enforcement. I'll cobble those together. It was minutes later that... Mohammed Barakat first appeared in the video. He was driving northbound on 25th. He had not yet gotten to the gotten to the Ninth uh, Avenue crossroad when he came into the Big Top Bingo video feed. So he's south of the crash. The crash would have been off to his left and just a little uh, a little bit north. He took that left turn onto 9th Avenue and then immediately took a right turn into the parking lot that was just adjacent 
to 25th and where the crash was. So he pulled immediately into that parking lot. At this point, only officers Hawes and Dotus are at the scene, along with fire, the, fire, the fire crew that got there first. So only have the two officers. He pulls in, and he's sitting in his vehicle facing 25th. The distance between him and the crash at that point would be about here to the second row, where I'm standing to the second row. And he sat there for a while observing the scene. The lights are flashing. As you can imagine, we've all seen how many crash scenes. Minutes later, he pulls out of that spot and he drives back onto 9th Street. I'm sorry, yeah, onto 9th Street, but then kind of twists a little bit, goes over to Big Top Bingo and parks in the parking lot. Again, he spends a short time there, still in full view, still in full view of the crash, Officer still on scene. After a couple of minutes, he drives out of the north side of that parking lot, takes a right turn, and gets stopped at the light. He's there for several minutes. At that point, the crash is off to his left, 20, 30 feet away, able to observe the officers at the scene, the Fargo fire at the scene, Barakat continues across 25th and into the trailer park on the other side. Takes the first, I guess you'd say the first block in, he takes a left turn and heads north and goes out of view of the video feed from Big Top Bingo. He's out of view for several minutes. Out of view for several minutes. And then you see him emerge again. Now in the alley... It is to the west of the parking lot where he parked in the first instance. I'm going to put up a. I'm going to put up a picture, if I can first, put up uh, image number one. This is Mohammed Barakat. You'll forgive the uh, lack of resolution. It's from a video. It's the best we could do at this time. I'm working on uh, other photos, and we'll have a, a request at the end of our proceedings today. Could you please go to uh, uh, item number two? I'm just going to get you oriented on this. Bear with me, but I think it, it, it helps to have a, a picture in your mind. This is the overhead shot. This is this not going to work on there. No, it works in my hand. It doesn't work on there. Okay, well, I'll point at it. The You see where the police cars are down here. That's where the crash, this is later on, everything's cleared. This is not during this incident, but this is where the crash took place out on 25th. That's the parking lot, just, just on the top of that is the parking lot where uh, Barakat was parked. Actually, that's still his vehicle. The furthest one to the right is still his vehicle. This is sometime after. Then there's that building, it's a private, uh, private uh, businesses there. Big Top Bingo is off to the left. The trailer park that I mentioned, would be in the foreground on this side. So you've got south, north to the right, west and east. Okay, so when I mentioned he's in, now he's in the alley after re-emerging, getting back on the video, he's in the alley right behind that building. And we see him come back into frame and he comes, proceeds, proceeds south on that alley, goes on, goes around the side of that building and again parks uh, right there where he's in full view of the, um, of the, uh, the crash scene and the officer's uh, activity. At 3.03, now remember those other times, at 3.03 p.m., officers Robinson and Jake Walleen show up at the scene. They are now the third and fourth officers to respond to the scene, and they show up while the defendant, who has now been casing this out for all those minutes, driving at it and coming at it from different angles, now he's sitting there watching, waiting for additional law enforcement and they came. Now you got a total of four Fargo police officers out there as of 3.03 p.m. At almost that exact time, one of the vehicles, and again, bear with me, I'm not going through this because we're all working on traffic and reconstruction here. These will all be relevant points. At some point right there, almost immediately after those two officers arrived, one of the crash vehicles drives up 
they're going to start clearing the road. It drives forward, whatever, 20, 30 feet to ninth, takes a right, goes around and comes right into the parking lot. And it is parked on our image here to the left of bar. It's the middle of the three cars there. Forget about the one on the left, far left. It's the middle of the three cars there. That's, that's the vehicle that was run into. That was the furthest south vehicle that was run into and had multiple o- occupants in it. They parked their vehicle right there next to Barakat, who's still in his vehicle in the driver's seat, looking out. Incidentally, he has spray painted all the windows in the back of his vehicle. Nobody can see into it. From a distance, it would look tinted. Standing next to it, you'd realize there's something else going on here. I can't see in there at all. But nobody noticed anything out of the ordinary, and they wouldn't have any cause to. Police are handling their site, um, and the defendant's just laying in wait inside that vehicle. The individuals in the crash vehicle, they get out. Now they want to look at the damage to their vehicle. Get out. They've got their cell phones out. They're taking pictures, I suppose, making calls and talking behind there, waiting for police to come over and talk to them. Carly is on the sidewalk. She's on the sidewalk almost directly in front of where the defendant's vehicle is facing. She's down on the sidewalk. Her vehicle remains uh, out in the street. That's important in a moment too. At this point, and I'll get to in a minute, we're not talking about much time having gone by here, a lot of activity, but not a lot of time has gone by. At this point, three Fargo police officers make their way up from the street, up into that lot, and start walking toward the crash vehicle to talk with those individuals. But remember, that that will then require they'll have to walk past Barakat's vehicle, and he's sitting in there. The windows are open. The back is, you can't see into the back. He's sitting there. And when they first are walking, I again, estimating 30, 40 feet away. They can't see into there and see that lying next to him on the seat is the double-magazined, 223 long rifle. That's police officer Jake Walleen, police officer Andrew Dottis, Otis, sorry, and police officer Tyler Hawes. Officer Robinson remains in the street. He remained in the street because the fire truck was going to be, be pulled away and going to be leaving, and his concern was there'd be too much space uh, that was open there. And he was worried that someone would come along, go into the turn lane, and maybe we'd have another accident. So he walked around. He was on the other side of Carly's car, just waiting uh, for what was going to come next. And he's going to go back and move his police vehicle up. But as officers Walleen, Doris, and Hawes started to make their way to talk to those other people, they're getting closer and closer to Barcott's vehicle with the open window. We're not releasing today the body cam videos. We will be in the fullness of time. When the time is appropriate. As they approach, best that's going to be able to give you 10, 15 feet away Barakat takes out his takes out his long rifle. It's scoped. It's got a double mag. He's loaded. He's got sixty rounds available to him. And what that is is uh, you, they're side by side. You use one up, and all you have to do is push the other one over, and you've got the access to the other thirty. That becomes a relevant point, also, beside the obvious. He opens fire. Barricade opens fire on the officers, and as Officer Robinson described to my BCI agent when telling about, you know, giving his his, his recount of what had happened, and as verified by listening to the uh, the audio, it is, he believed it to be, and reasonably so, automatic fire. It is rapid, rat-tat-tat-tat-tat-tat-tat, all made possible, all made possible because of what is known as a binary trigger.
Thank you. That's right. All possible because what's known as a binary trigger. Aftermarket, legal, purposeless. Pull around, let go, let go around. Pull around, let go around. Everything you hit, you'll hit twice because you've got the binary trigger. That's relevant for obvious. It appears that Fargo police officer Jake Walleen is the first struck. But it happened so rapidly, there's no way to really know which, which and, it, and I don't know that it matters, but he was about a foot and a half ahead, step and a half ahead of the other two officers. But in rapid succession, uh, Dotus and Hawes are hit. All of their hit. None of the officers even has so much as an opportunity to turn, to crouch, to grab for their, their service weapon, nothing. It's that rapid. It takes, it, they drop, drop, drop. Each of the officers, it terms later, stumbled, willed their way a little ways. In the wake of the shooting. Now there's no there's no pause in anything that I'm describing to you. I'm just trying the best that I can. rapidly run around to the other side of the vehicle and do the only thing they can do. They're crouching for their lives. They're crouching for their lives over behind the vehicle that they've just been in this accident with. Officer Robinson, who's out on the other side of that vehicle, God, God bless him, I'll tell you. One of the things he asks our investigator later did I remember to call it in? Uh, yeah, calm, calling it in. Shots fired, shots fired, knowing he's the last officer. He didn't call that in. There's no knowing what happens next. I mean, if he doesn't get that call in before something happens to him is what I'm saying. Calls it in, calls it in, stands up and immediately engages having no idea, especially in light of all the rapid fire. He has no idea how many, how many weapons he's facing. No idea. No idea. About one and a half times, I would say, between myself and Mike McFeely, about one and a half times that distance, back here in the purple shirt, is engaging a guy with a long rifle, scoped, sitting in his car, still sitting in the car, and he, the officer is away from his vehicle. He's got his, he's got his service weapon. And he engages. Barakat is not hit in that barrage from the officer. And, and he wouldn't be. There's not much space there. And he's inside of his vehicle. Barakat jumps out of the vehicle, opens the door, and runs around the back of his vehicle, positions himself on the passenger side, and has a direct line at the officer, who's that distance I just described. We think it's about 75 feet. Barakat with his scoped weapons got a direct line. Officer Robinson is obstructed by, by the crash vehicle, maybe to his waist, and he's firing direct on. At some point, again, this is all instantaneous. Carly does what any of us would do. She tries to take cover. She was on the sidewalk, remember. She wants to take, she runs to try to get behind a tree. It ain't much of a tree, but it's something. She makes it a couple of steps. The defendant sees her moving. So intent is he with his murderous resolve. He sees her moving. He goes off of the officer and comes over and shoots her. Again, striking his victim with multiple rounds. She's down immediately. Severely injured. In that instant, when he turned mildly profile, Officer Robinson, and he says, when he's talking to the BCI agents uh, days later, he tells them, you know, he knew he'd popped off several rounds when Barakat was in the car. Now he's got him around. He knows he's now, he's, he's standing up. He sees what's happened. He knows he's got officers down. He knows he's got the civilian down. 
knows he's got other civilians just off the side, and he tells himself, just squeeze. Careful, careful, squeeze. And he does. He hits the long rifle and incapacitates it. I don't think he'll tell you he was aiming for the long rifle. He's aiming for center mass, but he hits the long rifle. It's incapacitated, and he also hits Barakat. But Barakat's far from done. He takes the round, and, and he goes down. Now, Robinson comes from around the vehicle and is closing. A great peril to himself. Again, remember, he has no way to know if there are other gunmen, and this one's still moving. 16 times between there and, and the end of this whole, 16 times he directs the defendant to raise his hands, and the defendant does at one point with a nine millimeter in his hand that he's trying desperately, he's trying desperately to charge. Uh, charge, get, a, get around in the chamber. Drop the gun, drop the gun. He doesn't drop the gun, officer again fires. Barakat continues to move as the officer moves closer. This is where he calls in. I have three shots fired. I have three officers down. I have three officers down. Send everybody. I don't know if there's a more lonely human being on this planet than Officer Zach Robinson closing in on that scene. He's got three officers down. He's got a civilian who's been shot. He's got a guy he's closing in on that he's hoping like hell is the only shooter out here. Officer Robinson continues up through the grass toward Barakat's vehicle, he goes to the driver's side to keep the vehicle between himself and Barakat. Still, no other officers have been able to respond. This has happened so rapidly as they go along. I should have mentioned, and I didn't, it was two minutes, two minutes from when officers Walleen and Robinson arrived at the scene little under two minutes before gunfire erupted. All that was taking place in that period, two minutes. Now he's walking, Robinson is walking around behind the vehicle, coming around to the passenger side back there. Again, he's got the civilians hiding behind the car just off to, off to the, what would be the south there. And one last time, one final time, showing the restraint that I can't imagine God giving anyone under these circumstances. He says, again, drop your gun. He comes out from behind the vehicle. The defendant still has the gun in his hand. He's lying there. And the force used by the officer neutralizes Muhammad Barakat. When you're watching this, from the moment that the shooting starts, especially in hindsight, when you know the weaponry that Barakat had in that vehicle and in his hands, he had two handguns on him, including the nine millimeter I just referenced, and he had the long rifle. It's difficult to overstate how dramatically, especially at that distance, how dramatically outgunned police officer Zach Robinson was. And you're gonna have to rely on my recitation for now, but you'll see the you'll see that body cam video in time. And I know we'll all agree. That man was never outmanned. It was 3.06 and 34 seconds when Officer Robinson finally neutralized the defendant who remained alive but in significant distress. Robinson remaining composed. Another officer, uh, Officer Clower, is now at the scene. Again, these moments have passed. He must have been close by. He's now on the scene. He came right to uh, Robinson's side. Um, Robinson directs that he cuff him, uh, which you got to do because he's still still moving. They cuff him. And Officer Robinson immediately makes his way uh, to his fallen brother officers and to the area where they are being treated. 
uh, along with Carly. And eventually they're all being treated by uh, Fargo Fire, Fargo Police who are on the scene. And uh, each of them surrounded by a, by a blue wall and people around them literally encourage them, them to live. Stay with us. Stay with us, Andrew. Saying his name, squeezing his hand, massaging his shoulders, doing everything they can. Robinson's right there too. All the fire and rescue people all the Fargo police responding to this scene. All the law enforcement, not intentionally leaving anyone else out. You'll understand we didn't have these reports yet. I've got all the information. We've been in all these meetings, but not intentionally leaving anyone out. It would be horrific enough if this were the end. If that was all we knew, and that was the end of these horrible events in the wake of the fender bender on 25th Street South, Officer Robinson and the others, it would be heroic enough if we only knew that he had so courageously stood our enemy down. But as the investigation in the ensuing week has made clear, the thin blue line was severely, severely tested. Fargo police officer Zach Robinson was indeed the last man standing in that blue line at that moment, what he was standing between was not just the horrible events that were unfolding there, but between the horrible events that Mohammed Barakat had planned, had envisioned, planned, and intended, and armed himself for beyond fully that day. In the wake of these events, Law enforcement was moving rapidly, and I thank all of our law enforcement partners. We had tremendous help from the North Dakota Highway Patrol, the Sheriff's Office, the other police departments, the FBI, federal law enforcement. My friend Max Schneider, our, our U.S. attorney, is here today, and he's going to be talking a little bit, too. Search warrants. Quickly ascertain, we quickly ascertained where, what his residence was. We had to get into the vehicle. Law enforcement got eyes on the vehicle. Realize when they look in the back, they got a situation on our hands. The bomb squad was called in at one point, and the bomb sniffing dog hit on the vehicle as it later hit on his private residence in South Fargo. I'll get in a moment to some of the items uh, seized in the vehicle, but uh, I wanted to say that the, the search warrant uh, was attained uh, in federal court uh, later that night, and the search itself took place in the late night, morning, hours uh, the next day. First, the vehicle. If you could put up photo number three, please. This is Barakat's vehicle. Seat position exactly where it was, unmoved from the events I just described. There in the back seat, uh, you can see one of the firearms down on the ground, I think it is. And then uh, there are containers. There were three large, largish gas containers, all Actually, only two of them were gasoline containers. The third was another container, but they all had gasoline, all filled with gasoline. They find in the vehicle two innocuous-looking propane tanks. You might have for your Weber grill. But what they discovered was that they were they were filled, one completed at the top, the other one halfway up, with uh, explosive materials concocted at home, purchased lawfully, Compiled in his home. Uh, two of those in the, in the, in this vehicle. Switch to photo number yeah number four please uh, quickly, yeah just real quick. There's those items, S simple looking ga canisters for the gasoline, and then the two propane tanks, uh, as well. Item number five we showed you the other day. We'll show you that quickly. This was a self styled hand grenade works, by the way. Uh, fuse lighted. Uh, that was in the vehicle as well. And then go to item number six. These are the items seized from the vehicle at the scene of these atrocities. <sighs> number of weapons. A 380 semi-automatic handgun. 
remained in the vehicle during this event. Nine millimeter handgun utilized as I described. I don't have a better way to describe this. Uh, an AK style uh, rifle uh, not used in this event. Well, used, right? I mean, it's, it's in the vehicle though. And then the 223 round uh, weapon used by Barakat to kill uh, Officer Walleen and injure the others. Also at the scene, uh, 40 caliber handgun. Uh, that was also, that was on the defendant as well, in addition to the nine miller, millimeter that he was brandishing. And then there was another nine millimeter in the vehicle. So you got a, a total of four uh, handguns, uh, all semi-automatics and two uh, semi-automatic long rifles, sorry, three uh, semi-automatic long rifles, one and only one, and the one he picked with a binary trigger. Search warrant conducted at the residence in the aftermath. A variety of items. Uh, the FBI uh, was kind enough to carry out those Kind was just a bad choice of words, Mac. I, I, I didn't, we appreciate it very much. Uh, the FBI uh, sat on the residence, waited for the search warrant to come through. Uh, Mac and his team were working on it that night, got assigned by a federal judge, and they went in to, for the search the next day. A 12 gauge shotgun, another 12 gauge shotgun, a 22 caliber handgun, um, a Remington Model 700 deer rifle. That's going to sound familiar to a lot of us in the room. A very standard deer rifle weapon. A, another 223 rounded rifle. And a 9 millimeter handgun. An array of live ammunition uh, on the premises strewn about. A number of trail cameras uh, in, in, inside his residence. And I... I there's a maybe also in the in his storage garage or the garage uh, along with the unit, but there were a number of these uh, trail cams. Um, several phones and one computer and a variety of grenade parts. Those items are all uh, seized, obviously, uh, in relation to this uh, investigation. In the next days, the forensics investigator experts with the BCI. I see some legislators here in the room. You just approved four more of these. This is why. They are expert, but there are only so many of them. And thankfully, we, we had the folks to get, just get right on this. They worked around the clock on these computers, understanding that we may have a situation where there are other uh, proximate dangers uh, that we need to address immediately. I cannot thank them enough uh, for their tireless work. Tireless isn't the right word. I'm sure they were tired, but they weren't sleeping and they were getting through this on all of your behalf. Figured out uh, a long, interesting, not, not a social media presence, not a lot of uh, interaction or people with whom he would interact. We are continuing down every lead that we have from these phones and from the electronics and community contacting other people people with knowledge about him. The fact that we're having this uh, gathering with you today and the one a couple days ago, in part, should reassure you that we don't at this moment see additional threat emanating out of this incident. At this moment, if that were to change, you will know. We will let you know. That's our obligation, and that's what we'll do, of course. Numbers of searches. Interesting topics. Explosive ammo, kill fast, incendiary rounds, mass shooting events, how to, I guess, going through all mass shooting events around the country, picking up uh, what he could from reading about other events that have taken place. We've all heard copycats, no word unknown to law enforcement. Mass shooting events, chillingly area events. Area events where there are crowds in the Fargo-Moorhead area, Cass County area, all around. Singled out, singled out a few as he went along. And on the last search, on the last night at 
30 p.m. on July 13th, quote, thousands enjoy first day of downtown Fargo Street Fair. There have been inquiries about uh, the why. What's the motive? I've been in and out of law enforcement for 30 years. You might be surprised to, to know how many times you finish up and you're still scratching your head. You're still scratching your head. Motive, obvious motive to kill. I mean, driven by hate, driven by wanting to kill. Not particularized to some group that we can discern at this moment. Not particularized to one individual that we can see. The horrible winds of fate It's the best explanation I have for you for how he saw those officers on the way to where we believe he was going. And his pattern of when he got there, just casing out and driving around, sitting for several minutes and sizing it up, maybe he knew there'll be more law enforcement showing up. And he guessed right. But he's very patient going around, looking at it from all sides, just waiting. There, there would be no way that he would have known that that event couldn't have, obviously. It's a fender bend in South Fargo. And he's just proceeding. He, he'd come a long ways up, up 25th. Horrible, horrible winds of fate. In an instance like this, I'm not going to, I'm not a mental health professional, and I'm not going to pretend to be one. But officers who who lived through something like this, who maybe they responded as fast as they could and they couldn't get there fast enough. Others, the officers on the scene who were ambushed so completely, they had no ability, no, no moment, no instant to even reach for their weapons. Wondering what else could I have done? Should I check that? What else should I have done? They did all, they did all. We've described Officer Robinson's heroics. But every man and woman, you all know this, everyone who raises their hand and they take that oath and they don that uniform and they carry that badge knows that this can, it does happen all across this country routinely. And here too, we're not unknown to this. Every one of them. I know they, they, I think they're feeling this from all of you, from the community, recognition, whatever their role on that day. You were part of the line. You stood between these murderous intentions and acts. One officer remaining, he goes down, what, five, six blocks to downtown Fargo. The heroics that it took to preserve the lives of Carly, of Andrew, of Tyler. There wouldn't have been enough emergency personnel within a three state area to meet the needs. This is a painful week for law enforcement. It's also a reminder of the heroism of law enforcement. And if I could say uh, on their behalf, because I've heard it from them in the last week too, it's also a reminder how good you are. I've thought it many times in my life and career. The public doesn't get enough credit. You're good. You care. They see it. They feel it. I want to thank you on their behalf uh, for that. Uh, there's going to be some other uh, comments here. And we'll look forward to your questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Attorney General Wrigley. My name is Max Schneider. I'm the United States Attorney for the District of North Dakota. And on behalf of the Department of Justice, I want to express my sincerest condolences to the officers, their families, and the Fargo Police Department in the wake of this senseless violence. And I also want to share our deep gratitude for the heroism of the four officers and the courage and selflessness shown by Officer Zachary Robinson, whose grace under unimaginable pressure 
averted further tragedy as the Attorney General described. I want to speak today to the extent that I'm able about the efforts of Fargo or federal law enforcement undertaken since last Friday. And I also want to touch on the efforts still to come. Let me first say that there is no daylight between federal law enforcement and our state partners when it comes to responding to this terrible crime. I've been in regular contact with Attorney General Wrigley uh, since last Friday. And in that time, we have seen absolutely seamless coordination between the FBI, the ATF, and our state partners at BCI. They are true professionals uh, and the best partners in the truest sense of the word. Last Friday, ATF agents from the Fargo field office responded to the officer involved shooting within minutes of the incident. Uh, as has been discussed today and earlier this week, as shown on the screen, the deceased suspect was in the possession of an absolute arsenal of weapons and explosives that were with him at the scene uh, at the time of the shooting. ATF has since conducted crime gun intelligence queries and analysis interviews and provided technical resources uh, towards this investigation and ATF continues to work closely within its areas of expertise with the FBI, BCI, Fargo Police Department and other investigators. They're working to determine the motives of the deceased suspect as well as to identify any co-conspirators. Uh, likewise, the FBI's Minneapolis field office swiftly responded to the scene last Friday they provided immediate assistance to the Fargo Police Department and to BCI. The scene was thoroughly assessed by the FBI. The responsibilities for the ongoing investigation were divided amongst the agencies on the scene based on their areas of respective expertise. As the investigation progressed, it became evident that the judicial process would be necessary to gather further evidence. Uh, therefore, within hours of the shooting, the United States Attorney's Office, working with the FBI, obtained a federal search warrant for the deceased suspect's home. Pursuant to that warrant, the FBI began a search of the home alongside our partners at BCI, which also continued to investigate at the scene. As the Attorney General mentioned, FBI agents tirelessly searched the suspect's home through the early morning hours and into the day uh, on Saturday. And while searching the residence, FBI agents came across a significant amount of evidence, as you've heard discussed today, that included the electronic devices uh, that were described by the Attorney General. These electronic devices were lawfully seized and shared with BCI for the purpose of conducting an examination. Those devices and the other items recovered for evidentiary purposes are currently undergoing meticulous examination and evaluation. As our investigation continues, the FBI remains fully committed to working closely with our local, state, and federal partners. It's understandable and completely justified to want to know why. Why did this senseless violence happen? What could possibly motivate someone to ambush young officers in the line of duty? How could murderous chaos and this type of evil arise on a familiar street in Fargo, North Dakota? A week after this horrible tragedy, federal law enforcement agents are working around the clock with their state counterparts at BCI to find answers. And as that investigation continues, I want to be clear about three things. Number one, after an aggressive review of the evidence thus far, we have no reason to believe the public is in further danger. Number two, even at this early stage of the investigation, if there was clear evidence of motive, we would share it. And number three, when this investigation has been concluded and no st stone is left unturned, we will update the public as we are able. That will either be at a briefing like this one, or it will be through our filings in court. In the meantime, federal law enforcement will continue to work closely with our partners at BCI on this important investigation. And we'll continue to hold the officers, their families, 
and the Fargo PD close in our hearts. Thank you, sir. And uh, thanks to all of our partners up here have been tremendous. Uh, we have worked seamlessly with all of them uh, and our community. We're very appreciative for those efforts. I want to provide a little bit of uh, happy news to you in terms of uh, Officer Dotus and Hawes, or Hawes, I'm sorry. Um, yesterday, they were both able to stand up out of their beds briefly, which is miraculously very good news and uh, a blessing for all of us. Very happy about that. They continue to have a significant road to recovery, not insurmountable, but we need those continued thoughts and prayers for them and their families who have gone through a tremendous horror here in the last week. Uh, so I wanted to let everyone know about that. And uh, as soon as they are in a position, um, we're excited to get them back with the rest of the team and the family um, and go from there. So that, that's a little bit of good news and, and all of the chaos that we've had to deal with. The other thing I'd like to reiterate and, and knowing a little more about this now and, and listening to the Attorney General, it was clear that this individual was a calculated, insidious, murderous individual, dead set on hurting, killing as many people as possible. He had the intent, he had the commitment, he had the means. But for the intervention of our courageous and brave Fargo PD personnel. Zach Robinson, obviously without doubt, courageous, courageous, the last man there to prevent war from happening. But all of our officers, Jake Willeen, likely the first person hit, that would seem to me to make a lot of sense based on his fatal injury. He took that bullet that someone else in our community might have otherwise taken. Andrew Donis, Tyler Hawes, took other bullets that other people in our community would have otherwise likely taken. And so I don't want it lost on anyone that all of these folks, including our firefighters who were out there in a very dangerous situation, did the very best they could to keep all of us safe. There's a lot of concern, legitimate concern about other threats and danger to the community. Uh, we agree. We're concerned as well. Uh, we're, we've been meeting here with uh, the mayor and, and others in evaluating our special events to see if there's other things that we can add for safety. And so you may see more visible signs uh, to help prevent as much as we can and there have always been and will continue to be other things that you don't see, but rest assured that our personnel are out there in many ways, both physically and from an intelligence platform, working with our state and federal local partners to make sure that we're doing everything we can to prevent harm to our community and allowing you to go, to go out and enjoy a beautiful city, entertainment, spend time with your family without fear of that type of activity occurring. But the reality also is there's evil in the world. This guy was one of them. He's an evil individual. And the only thing that stops evil are likely two things. An engaged, supportive community, which we have, their ability to communicate and let us know about things that they know or see. And we've seen this across the country as well, where some of these types of mass events have been upended by the good work of community members, sometimes family members, which can be very difficult when the person is a member of your family, but you're seeing this and you know this isn't right and bad things might happen, we encourage that interaction. The only other option is the courageous intervention of our law enforcement personnel. And that's what happened on July 14th. And we should never forget that. Uh, we avoided, I think, a major catastrophe here in our city. And it's still a very big tragedy, the loss of Officer Willeen, Officer Dodas and, and uh, Haas who are injured. Um, you know, that, that's gonna be with us for a while. And then the great, you know, the heroic efforts of, of Officer Robinson as well. So, and think about all the personnel from Fargo PD who responded to this. 
giving life-saving efforts to their colleagues, right? So um, tremendous work, tremendous work by the fire department. Um, I just want you to know that we are safe. This is a safe city, but evil's out there. We're doing our best to look for it and prevent it. We appreciate your help in that effort as well. Thank you. thing yeah uh for jake welling we're going to have a funeral on saturday in his hometown area i just want to remind the public that next wednesday at one o'clock at shields arena we will have a memorial service and would ask the public to honor that uh, jake just started for our force and sometimes it's hard to know all the wonderful things about the young man but i think if the community can reach out and attend that that would be tremendous I appreciate all the GoFunding that people are doing for our officers that are wounded. Uh, tremendous spirit amongst the, the team that's uh, standing now. We all have a heavy heart, and I think many of us are grieving as this time goes on. But I would appreciate it if the community would turn out of the memorial service and honor the man that gave his life for us. Thank you. Uh, one last thing before we get to questions. I wanted to put this phone number out there. This is, a, I'm told, the first photograph of Mohammed Barakat that's out publicly. I thought I had seen something in the earliest days of this, but it was internally uh, with some reports. And so this photograph is out. We're going to find something with better resolution. But there could be people out there who might have in interesting information. And I would just ask you to not judge for yourself maybe what's interesting. His comings and goings, associations, information you might have. I'd ask you to call the BCI, that information, 701, of course, 328. That's easy to remember, like every state number, but 5500, 328, 5500. With any information you might have uh, about whether it's this incident, something that you, that you saw, or uh, the comings and goings, the, the life and practices of Mohammed Barakat. That would be glad to uh, take your questions. I, I, I would be remiss if I didn't pass this along too. And the mayor uh, just mentioned this. Um, in talking with the families of the injured officers, and yesterday I spoke, and with uh, Carly's family, and yesterday I spoke with with uh, uh, Jeff and Amy, uh, Officer Willene's parents. I hope that you know how much they feel the outpouring from everybody. I really hope the community understands that because they, their hearts are running over. They uh, have felt very, very supported. And that includes by the, the members of the Fargo Police Department um, and a recognition of the life-giving care of, of uh, the fire department chief. I, I know how proud you are with good reason and everyone else. And uh, I was asked to pass that along and I'm doing it publicly. I, I, uh, the people of this region, and these organizations uh, need to be congratulated and thanked because these families uh, are feeling feeling that love and, and support. But that will take uh, any questions that we're allowed to handle. We're going to have to make sure you got a microphone on you because there are people watching remotely. Sure. So be patient with us if you could. Um, can can you share more details on uh, Mohammed Barakat's background as well as uh, what specifically points to potentially further carnage at the, the street fair, I believe, is the location you mentioned, Drew? Uh, a little bit. Not not a great amount more about, uh, you know, we know a little bit more, but uh, at this point, what I would share with you is he was a Syrian national. He came to the United States, uh, a, a, we're told. I'm informed by our federal partners, uh, came here on an asylum uh, request in 2012. He was, he was, uh, he became a U.S. citizen in 2019, um, working off and on different odd jobs, uh, all of which, you know, we're, we're pursuing those matters and, and interviewing people. And, and that's about what I'm going to say about that. As to his specific intent, the months, actually across years, it seems like he lost the will at one point, maybe if, if there was a pause in there. Uh, and then it, then it regained again, where he's looking at the mass casualty events talking about looking for uh, the impacts of specific types of injuries, uh, looking for particular kinds of uh, firepower that are available and certain kinds of bullets that are available. And then amassing um, 
this weaponry at all and then moving significant amounts of it into into his vehicle that day uh, including the last minutes we've got video of him going out of his place with a suitcase in which he's got you know more weapons more rounds so you know his intent was uh, pretty evident we as i said in the days leading up to there he's looking for specifically to the region for um, large crowd events in the region and uh, based on the time and the direction where he was going he was uh, now he was either likely to be taking a right when he got to main avenue going downtown taking a left when he got to main avenue and going out to the fairgrounds those are the two large uh, large events going on at that time 1800 rounds of ammunition uh, in the uh, in the vehicle multiple weapons which i just described uh, a vest it was not a tactical vest it wasn't a bulletproof vest but he had a vest just absolutely stuffed with uh with magazines and uh one piece of information we picked up just yesterday uh putting the finishing touches on his shooting skills in the last hours before this assault this question is for mac was um barakat on the radar of federal agents or federal law enforcement at all prior to this i'm going to defer to the ongoing investigation on that tasha uh last press conference there was some talk about um him being known bearcat being known a little bit to law enforcement to some degree either local or federal um, can you explain anything more about that uh, we know some more i'm going to relay a little bit more um, there were some contacts along the line of, uh, he had a fire in his place, cooking fire, I think it was. And, uh, um, and there was some contact with, uh, the fire department. There was, uh, a report that was made, uh, some while back. I'm not going to go into the details of it a, also because I don't have it. It's called the guardian report. It's a federal report of some kind. There was talk of him being on a watch list information that we have from our federal partners is he was not on the terrorist watch list, but there was this guardian report some years back um, made by a member, uh, someone who was familiar with him or knew him. Um, it was, I'm not gonna say much about it except to say it is not, we are told um, about a threat of violence or an act of this nature or anything along these lines. I'm gonna leave it at that. Um, what about any um, affiliations, religious, uh, anything that you've discovered so far that you can disclose? Uh, if I say to you that I'm not going to discuss that, there's going to be assumptions, right? People are going to say, oh, they, they think they know something. I would caution people uh, along those lines. Uh, as, actually, Mac and I talked about this a little bit this morning. And I, it, it, is, it is fair to say that we have, we've established no ties even to the Muslim community here in the area. Um, we have no ties been established in that regard. And uh, um, beyond that, I don't have much... Uh, at this point, it seems more notable that he's Muslim than that I'm Lutheran. Uh, that, uh, from where we're at with the investigation right now, that's fair. And I think we should we should put that out there. Just wondering if you can give an update on the civilian who was shot. Forgive me. I'm... Can you give an update on the civilian who was shot? I am, I spoke to Carly's uh, mother a couple of days ago. And I believe that Carly was moved out of the IC unit as well. I, I called her mom on the way down here today and I'm waiting for a call back. Um, she was very seriously injured. She's got a, uh, a medical road up ahead. She's in good spirits, though. I, I talked to her uh, over the weekend, I think Saturday or Sunday, maybe both. Um, uh, she was in, in relatively good spirits having gone through this. Um, I assured her... Uh, that she's come to the right kind of community, told her a little bit about what I know about this place uh, that my family's called home our whole lives. Um, you know, came here and uh, and has great, had great plans, I think has great plans, but she's got a hurdle here uh, with her health. And I just, I have every, every, every belief that she's gonna uh, make her way forward. She's um, got a little ways before she's gonna be able to put some weight on things um, but she was very severely injured uh, that's a high power round and um and she's got a ways to go but uh uh great parents uh, it was uh, good to talk with them and and i know that they appreciate the outpouring in this community that didn't even really know her daughter yet
Uh, with Barricott having seemingly no online presence and the fact that uh, he didn't seem very connected in the community, um, maybe wasn't communicating with people via cell phone much, um, what other, are you looking into or are others looking into some other means of communication he might have been using? Um, and if so, what would those be? Like perhaps the dark web or something to that? I'll just leave it at the, the uh, perfectly reasonable question and I'm just gonna leave it at yes. I mean, all all pursuits are, are on. I mean, everything that they find when we go into the phones, I mean, those are a roadmap to your life, right? The phone and get on the computer and see what that presence is. Everybody's got some presence, everybody's got some footprint. And, uh, you know, you just keep going through financial documents, financial records, anything that you can find. I, uh, I mean, spent uh, 10 years as the United States attorney here in the state and uh, 30 years in out of law enforcement. I, you'd be surprised sometimes that how just uh, amazingly resourceful federal, state, local, tribal law enforcement are and pursuing all, any and all uh, avenues based on the evidence that, that they're finding uh, as they go along. When I mentioned the scant presence on social media, I mean, I thought I was the only person in America that never had a Facebook account. Uh, he just doesn't have that that we can see now. Doesn't mean there never was. No, you never know. We're going back and looking around for others. But we're a week into this, and it continues. Maybe I missed this, Attorney General, but how, how far back does the timeline go when he was searching out different methods of mayhem, and, and, and how long does the back does the acquiring of weapons go about the weapons mike how, how far back when did he start compiling the, the okay. weapons and then and how far back did the timeline go of searching how long was he preparing to do that something okay. um the searches i know go back a, a few years uh chief deputy ness was just looking at it again the way over here do you have a do you remember the, the for this year back on the searches Yeah, I, mean, I think you heard her. Preliminarily, the furthest back that we have is 2018 uh, that we see on those searches. But again, do we find more? I don't know. And, and as for the firearms, to our knowledge, what we've been informed by our federal partners, they're all purchased lawfully. And I don't know if uh, the U.S. Attorney has information along those lines that you can share uh, for how far that goes back. But we have reason to conclude that it, it goes back a little ways. Okay. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Yeah, the ATF has not concluded their investigation on that. You can be assured they're looking into whether any component parts of these guns were illegally provided or things of that nature, but it's ongoing, Mike. And then do, do we know why he stopped at the incident to harm the police officers? Is there is there evidence in the in the search of his computer that he had something against police officers or what do we know there? That's a good question. Uh, to the first part, we don't know. And I think it was just happenstance. As I said, how could he possibly know, anyone know, that there was a crash on 25th and he happened to just be proceeding down that way and had been for quite some while. We've got video of him being on 25th quite a way south. So he just happened upon that. But his intention, we've described uh, where we get to that. And, and he gets to the scene and he starts casing it out uh, in the way that we described. And forgive me, Mike, I know there's a second part to that. You, you, you said a second part to that. Beyond I just, just, I just, I said, did, did he, is there evidence in his oh. search of, of a dislike or hatred of police officers? Still preliminary. We don't yet have anything. There's not like some screed against uh, the police. There's uh, the uh, federal authorities are going through some, some uh, they, they need to use some language experts, um, uh, foreign language experts to go through a couple of items around there. Maybe we'll see something, but nothing online so far, nothing on the phone so far. Nothing that we can gather from the community. We've talked to some family members. No, uh, nothing along those lines yet. Not foreclosed at all. Wait, and one more. Is it, you said that in the propane tanks, there was explosive materials. So was there not propane in them? And was that, were they filled with something else? Sorry, thank you. Another good question, Mike. Thanks. I, I didn't mention that in my remarks. Should have. The bomb squad seized those items and they have detonated those items. And it was quite dramatic. I mean, anyone who's familiar with substances like tannerite, uh, which, which are uh, ignited by a high-power rifle, um, this is a full canister full of it. One is full and one is half. Uh, they've been detonated. Um, I've reviewed that evidence, uh, the, the video evidence and everything else of it, quite dramatic explosions. Uh, and, of course, they disintegrate the, uh, the metal encasement of the, uh, of the tank. So that was uh, easily detonated, uh, explosive device and um, 
he had the means by which to to blow it up anytime he wanted to, and so uh, that that uh, remains uh, a, an area obviously uh, of interest in, in in tracking down the where, when, why, and the how isn't very complicated. Like I said, what can you tell us about Barricade's history prior to coming to the U.S. in two thousand twelve? Uh, as a state law enforcement official, I don't have uh, access to the information about that, and I don't know that that's something the U.S. Attorney can speak to. I know as uh, having been the U.S. Attorney, I know U.S. Attorneys don't like being spoken for, so I'm not going to do that. Yeah, and not to sound like a broken record, but that, that's part of the investigation. To that point, then, has anyone spoken to his family, and are they in the United States, and if you have, did he make any comments to them about these events? Uh, we have spoken with, he has some family in the United States. I'll leave it at that. They, are, they do not live in the area. Um, they're outside of the region. Uh, they have been spoken to. Uh, it doesn't sound like a particularly close communication uh, pattern between them. And no, uh, no information that I can give to you right now, not because I'm holding it back, just nothing to, to share along those lines at this point. Um, but those uh, communications will continue as part of the investigation. Can you say at all, perhaps a message to the Muslim community here? Because there is some concern and worry that just given the name, that there may be some sort of tie. And while a motive is unclear, or you have said it doesn't seem he intended to be tied to any particular group, again, there is some concern. Um, I, I don't have the perfect thing to say along those lines, except uh, to caution people about about that. I mean, we would be sharing if we had something particularized. I think I made a comment before that probably speaks that better than anything else. At this point in the investigation, I, I find his Muslim faith no more notable than my Lutheran faith. Um, we uh, we have established and been told about and seen no ties between him and the Muslim community here, and uh, and saw nothing in the online search to this point. You know, we've all read about people being radicalized, all of those things, and perhaps people can forgive the impulse or whatever. I don't know the impulse to wonder, but if you know. If and when that becomes part of this, that will be shared. But we're sharing with you now what we know and uh, what we've seen. And I, I stand by my early comment to repeat it right now. Question for Drew first and then uh, Mac. Um, were there any Muslim or Islamic faith related materials recovered at the suspect's home? Recovered from his home? Yeah, was was there was there were there any? I mean, is there a Quran? Is there Muslim? Yep. You know, you, you're you're. It sounds like you're assuming he was of the Muslim faith and saying it's not necessarily related to the, uh, to the to the crime, um, and and some in the Muslim community are saying, just because his name's Muhammad doesn't mean he's Muslim. I'm asking if there's anything that would lead you to believe. Yeah, and just because someone has a Bible doesn't make them a Christian either. So, but I can answer your question: Is that there was a there was a Quran found at his house, but. All right, and then the other question for you is um, uh, co-conspirators. Um, you know, some people are surmising with that amount of guns, you know, you can only shoot one gun at a time. So if your plan was to go to a downtown street fair or some other uh, popular, populated event, uh, you know, you couldn't possibly use all those weapons yourself anyway. I mean, is there still a possibility there was a co-conspirator? Uh, there's no way for us to foreclose that there's a co-conspirator. We can tell you that we're out here talking about it a week later because at this point, uh, we don't believe there to be a present concern uh, of others. But I, our investigation has not foreclosed that, and I don't. I, I've learned a little bit in 30 years of this. You don't foreclose things that can materialize in an investigation. So that's what we're doing. And um, as for you know, arming himself uh, to the teeth, as they say, like that, I mean, he had, he had three high power rifles in that vehicle. And he selected the one that gave him the best opportunity to put out the most rounds uh, in the mayhem that he wanted to create and the murderous intent that he had. 
Um, the, uh, the other rounds, 1,800 rounds, well, he got through 30 rounds out of that weapon like that. He got through, he got through that, it, actually 40, we think 40, 41 rounds uh, out of that weapon. And that's when it gets incapacitated by Officer Robinson, leaving 20 more in it. He wasn't in a position to get back into that vehicle, but he can put a lot, you can put a lot of rounds through one of those weapons uh, in a hurry. So um, I, I don't, um, I, it raises the question, but it doesn't answer the question that there had to be more co conspirators because he had more guns. He was a gun, he was a, a, a gun, a person who had amassed quite uh, an array and perhaps to give himself more flexibility depending on what it was he was intending on doing because he was searching a lot of different events and our belief that day we've already stated. And he selected the weapon uh, in accord with what his intentions were that day and developed that moment when he saw the police officers case it out for a while and, and waited. And in fact, more officers did show up. Uh, Mac, next question for you, actually two part question. One, True mentioned earlier something about a guardian report. Is there a federal guardian report that would be like some kind of a list that he would have been on? What is that? Well, you, you heard the attorney general's comments, Scott. Uh, I'm going to refrain from commenting further beyond what I've already said earlier. Uh, that'll all bear out in time. But for now, I'm going to defer to the ongoing investigation. But you just you can't tell me whether there's a Guardian report or not? I think you heard the Attorney General's comments, Scott. Okay, so there is. Last question then for you, um, Mac. Are there any plans or is there even a means to do, a, a, you know, a, an investigation that goes back to his refugee uh, application? I know that there's investigations that are done before these people are accepted for refugee status. Is that information still readily available as far as the investigation? I'm gonna answer that a little bit indirectly. I have full faith that the FBI, working in conjunction with the ATF, and our partners at BCI at the state level are going to conduct a completely thorough investigation. That investigation is going on right now. It's being conducted aggressively and intensely, and we trust them to follow all appropriate leads. So was this an act of terrorism? Was there some orchestration behind it, behind the, beyond the terror that was offered? And uh, my question would pertain to how quickly the federal warrant came. And Mac, I'm curious if the Department of Homeland Security is part of this. A couple of questions in a row there, Joel. I'll, I'll do my best to answer them. With regard to motive, if we had clear evidence of that, we would share it. We would absolutely share it. The state of affairs is that the investigation is ongoing. Uh, ATF, FBI, BCI, they will all be looking into uh, the issue of motive. What was the second part of the question? How fast is was the Department warranted? of Homeland Security involved in your investigation? I, think, I remember that the second question, that was the third one. Well, the second question is, you know, when you look at this, the federal warrant came right away. That's not always so easy. Well, it is easy when you have dedicated people like our partners in the FBI and the talented career assistant United States attorneys and support staff in the U.S. Attorney's Office. Okay. We would think to do otherwise. That was one, one more. Um, did the murderer work out of Holly, Minnesota? And if he did work out of Holly, Minnesota, why can't we have a more clear picture? Why can't there be a, a more picture or a picture that shows him more clearly if, in fact, Mr. Attorney General, your investigation has shown that and there was uh, the opportunity, for example, for him to be on a website? Um, sorry, my phone's here. I, uh, uh, in addition to us uh, going through and trying to find a photograph the other day, I, I got the message from you about uh, the the provision that uh, you believed or some believe uh, might uh, supersede those DOT provisions. And we, we looked into that. I'm not sure that we agree. We, but I am, I do want to get it out though. I mean, I, I, in fact, if we can get it out today, we want to, uh, a higher resolution picture would be better. Uh, you can't live in a community like this and not have some people have some familiarity with you. So we're going to do that. And I would, you know, in maybe the next couple of, of, of hours, we can, uh, to get that out. Uh, Mac has a, an excuse. He works for somebody. I, I guess I don't, I'm not sure. So we're going to, we're going to probably move ahead and be able to get that out. It, it's something that Mac and I have discussed a bit here in the last days and um, absolutely just bear with us for maybe for another couple of hours. We want to get this one out uh, now, but that's what we've got right now. I don't have anything for you on that. 
I don't have anything to say for you on that. We've got we've had some contacts with different uh, businesses that he's uh, worked at over recent years, and those are ongoing discussions. And I just don't want to uh, um, alert people to that, and that can obstruct an investigation pretty quickly when people start getting other people coming to them, and and um, it can undermine our efforts. So we don't want to do that. Um, is there any evidence that points towards Barricat intentionally creating a diversion? That's a, that's a really good question to say, intentionally di creating a diversion. It's just such a, it's such a common technique uh, for people who want to uh, engage in a mass casualty event, which we do think is very well established. We think it's apparent even before we get to the computer, frankly, based on the armaments that he had. Then when you get into the searches, you realize it, it's a topic of interest to him and not because he wanted to be a first responder. He was looking at events out there, uh, sizing them up all around. He had interest in beseeching that all around, not just in the region at all. We haven't had one for him to read. So, um, but to know it uh, with certainty, like I know the names of my three children, no. It, I, uh, pretty common in law enforcement. You don't, again, you don't, you can't climb inside their brains and people don't say, you know, write it all down and out. But it's a good question. And I think all evidence uh, points in a direction in that regard. And it's a very common technique. Uh, and uh, based on the search from the computer, how he was armed, where he was headed, and he sees this event that this tends to distract him and give him an opportunity to do something to begin uh, the process of carrying out what he wanted to ultimately carry out. It, uh, I, I said it before, you know, the horrible winds of fate sometimes uh, but those events fell into, fell into place and fell into his path. Uh, can someone just clarify what exactly in general a guardian report is? I don't even know. I, I gotta tell you, I literally had never heard the phrase before uh, until last Friday night. It wasn't, a, it wasn't a phrase with which I was familiar. We're all familiar with the terrorist watch list. And I don't know uh, when they came up with the, uh, the reporting system that, that led to Guardian reports. I, I have literally never heard it referenced uh, in light of an investigation until this instance and still have not been provided a copy of the Guardian report in this, in this case. The fact that he has no, is there anything you wanted to add, Matt? Can you provide any insight now that you're the U.S. attorney? I I think that's pretty well covered. Essentially, it's a way for the public to engage local law enforcement and notify them about things of concern. So somebody from the public, could that have been when the fire department responded to the, the fire at his home, that they would have maybe forwarded some report onto law enforcement that they saw some concerning items? Yeah, I, I, there's a lot, a lot of information on our part up here. So I just ask you to not conflate the two. The, the fire incident had nothing to do with the Guardian report. Totally separate. Totally separate. I, I maybe answered in the same way because it was part of, at the same time because they were. I was asked the question by someone generally law enforcement contacts and. Okay. Uh, I mean, to, to be clear on all of these, these are we're answering you the best that we can, both responsibly and then also what we know at this point. Don't come back to me in two weeks and say, Drew, you didn't tell us that we had that information. We're 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 taking the step of moving forward here. This is another area, Mac and I have been. You know, you talk about no daylight, just seeing that, that this, recognizing that, that this is an important thing to do. The public uh, has, has very understandable concern and, and, and love and outpouring, of course, for law enforcement and for, and for Carly, but also about what's being done in response to it. So that's why we're doing this and taking this extraordinary step. But then we've got constraints on what, what we can share with you. The fact that you can't find pictures or social media presence, does that just kind of show how far under the radar He's been operating in Fargo, and does that add to this investigation? Why someone would be like that? I, I mean, that, that that speaks to it. I mean, I we tell our kids all the time, right? And everyone, once it's out there, it's out there, and that's right. So it, it's, a, it's a little out of the ordinary. There's nothing nothing out there. Um, when I say nothing, but I mean, there's been some things I... People have provided a video of saying this. they think this is him. Can you verify this is him? I can't. I can't verify that that's him. 
not because I'm being coy. I just, I, I look at it and I don't know, we all change with weight gain, weight loss. We don't know on, on those matters. We may know in a few weeks, we may have some of those answers. Right now, you've got the image that we've got that, that with the resolution that we've got uh, to Joel's question, both a, a day or two ago, and now we're gonna try and try to get that DOT picture out. Who thought, right? I mean, we've all got our driver's license, we're showing it to everybody. And there's all sorts of uh, legal hurdles and we'll try to we'll try to move that out too. And just one last question here. You said it appeared on his internet searches, he lost the will. Can you elaborate? No. Was he planning something years ago? Or what did you mean by those comments? No, I, I, I just meant that it, that it wasn't a steady stream of like every other day he's going online and finding it. It seemed like he went along the lines of looking, there was a little more intense search period and then it abated for a while. And then he, re, he rejoined uh, the effort to gain knowledge about mass casualty events uh, and so forth. That, that's all. It's just, a, it's just a reading of the tea leaves that are provided by the search history. Drew, you and Mac touched a little bit on the forensics uh, as kind of a detailed phone question, but was he fairly active in texting and calling this past month? I mean, there was, did he have a lot of contacts that he was in communication with um, days prior? Um, I've uh, said pretty much everything I'm going to say about that at this point, other than to just say with the information that we have right now, um, I, I would characterize it as not very, not very active. Okay, and then Mac, you said the forensics being done on writings and language. Um, you know, a lot of people talk about manifestos in cases like this. It doesn't sound like there was one, but is there writing you guys are examining stuff that he had maybe written online or just emails, what have you? Yeah, that's all part of the ongoing investigation. 